Well, hello everyone, welcome. It's great to see the crowd and uh, on the after Thursday afternoon. This is great. Uh, my name is Richard Carpiano, I'm a professor of public policy here at UCR. Um, I want to say also hello to uh, the people who are joining us by Zoom. And it is my pleasure, my, my extreme pleasure, to introduce our speaker for today. And in some ways, I feel I mean, I, I could give, uh, for how accomplished that she is, I could give a very long introduction here, but I feel like there's the old saying about the speaker preventing everyone from getting to sort of the meal. Well, this is kind of getting to the uh, getting to the meat of the, meat of the talk today. So I'm going I'm to keep it quite brief, but it is wonderful when a uh, internationally recognized scholar contacts you out of the blue and says, hi, Rich, I'm going to be visiting in town, and uh, would it be possible to come by and uh, chat with you about my new research? So it's... Uh, Obviously, this is a wonderful opportunity that landed on our, uh, landed on our laps, and we're wonderful. It's been wonderful to host you for today. And so, everyone, um, I'd like to just briefly introduce uh, our speaker. So, uh, Professor Katie Atwell um, comes to us from Perth, Australia, from the University of Western Australia. She's a political scientist and public policy scholar um, who has been uh, you know, a, a leading international voice around vaccination uh, policy, particularly around uh, around mandates and leads a very exciting initiative at the University of Western Australia uh, called the, I hope I'm saying this right, the VaxPoll Lab, which is an interdisciplinary effort to uh, understand uh, not only effectiveness of vaccine policies, but also uh, their implementation uh, and uh, a couple other things with this as well, thinking off here. Uh, but not just for Australia, but also in terms of applying it across uh, different international settings, uh, including California, which is going to be the focus of, of, our, of our talk today. Um, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to keep this brief to make sure that we have enough time for the talk, and I'm sure there's going to be lots of lively Q&A. Could you please give me, uh, join me in giving a warm welcome to uh, Dr. Atwell. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction, Mitch, and um, acknowledgements to the senior faculty who are here and all the lovely students as well. And I want to do a shout out to the wonderful students who posted me today already. Um, met some really wonderful young people studying on this campus, so you should all be very proud of yourselves. Um, so it's kind of strange to come here as someone not from here and be talking to you about your state and country, but I guess I'll just acknowledge that weirdness and then move on. So um, I'm here to talk in a way about this book, which is called um, uh, America's New Vaccine Wars, California and the Politics of Mandates. But um, I'll also be going a little bit beyond that, explaining to you uh, the genesis of the book. And in questions, we can also talk about the other cases that I study, which include my own country and Italy and France as well. So um, back in, now I'm going to say 2017, I had started to see that something was on the march, right? And that four jurisdictions, four global jurisdictions, had recently made their childhood vaccination policies much stricter in terms of mandates. So these four jurisdictions were your own state, um, Australia, I know I could have put up Sydney, but I'm from Perth, so I put up a picture of Perth. Uh, and of course we have Italy and France. So all of them had um, undertaken some quite big changes in terms of imposing new consequences or expanding the suite of vaccines for their childhood vaccine mandates. And I wanted to study that. So I applied for a fellowship from the Australian government and was successful which gave me three years full time to do exactly that. Then a global pandemic hit. So I kind of took a bit of time out of that to do a lot of coded work and then finally did come back to finish the project. And I've been working on a book that looks at all four cases, which hopefully will be out next year. Uh, but I realised the California case was so interesting that it needed its own whole book. And so I wrote that book with my friend and colleague, Professor Mark Naven from Oakland University, but not the Oakland in California, the Oakland in Michigan. Um, so we wrote this book together, and that's what I'll be talking about today. There it is. So school vaccines in school vaccine mandates in your country, um, as you know, are kind of ubiquitous. They're in almost every state. But the work that we've done, the work in the book, is really looking at how efforts um, since the 2010s have really focused on. Um, if we want to change vaccine uptake in this country, we're going to be looking at mandates. We're going to be focusing on those policies that require uh, kids to be vaccinated before they can enrol in school. And um, major physician organisations, including the ones listing on this slide, now have it as their policy that they think that every state legislature should be passing 
the kinds of policies that California now has, which I'll be explaining. So this is now an effort um, that is, is kind of a national effort that saying that if you have a school entry vaccine requirement, which all states do, you should also not have non-medical exemptions. You should require people to vaccinate unless there is a medical reason for the kid not to be vaccinated. So this is just to show you how ubiquitous the school entry vaccine mandates are. They are in every state. The white states are ones which now have these new strict policies of no non-medical exemptions. Um, and the rest of them we can see that either have a religious exemption, which sometimes is interpreted quite broadly, not just religion, but also belief more generally. And obviously a personal belief exemption would pick up religious and non-religious beliefs. So one of the arguments of the book is that removing non-medical exemptions from your vaccine mandate, which California did in 2016, is a bigger deal than people might think. So I'm gonna talk through why that's the case. So America's had these vaccine mandates for school entry since the 1960s and 70s. Now, that wasn't the first time vaccines were mandated. You guys had smallpox vaccine mandates well before that, but Mark and I talk about the modern, the modern ones, the ones that are still in place now. They started to kind of be introduced in the 1960s and 70s. And it's really important to understand why they were introduced, because you might think, well, you know, they were introduced to make people vaccinate. But actually, they were really introduced as a way of government doing policy. They were introduced as a way of getting needles into arms. And in many ways, especially, as I would say, informed by my global comparative work, they were done because the state, there were things that the state couldn't do. They were done to address deficiencies where other countries might be getting vaccines out to people in different ways. So basically what we have at the time is we have the polio vaccine, then we have the measles vaccine coming out. And, you know, the scientists, everyone's really excited. Wow, like we can save lives. We can stop kids dying from these diseases. But at the same time, you know, we need the policymakers to invest in the programs we need to actually, you know, deliver and implement these programs. And that was a challenge. So there had been federal funding, which then Nixon uh, didn't reauthorize, and they were rolling out the measles vaccine and the uptake is just not going as well as people would like, as policymakers would like. So they start to think about ways that they can actually get more vaccines into more people. And what they realise is that it's very cheap and easy, if you're the government, to just associate that with school enrolment. Um, that's a really good way of you not having to do very much or spend very much money, and someone else is going to make sure that this happens. So it's cheap and easy for the state, and it really outsources responsibility. So the families have to schlep along to the uh, clinicians to get the vaccines done. The clinicians play their role in doing the vaccinations and the schools play their role in checking and, you know, cataloging data and reporting that to authorities. And it's not really costing the government any money. So that's, that's the main reason they do it. Um, but also because that's the main reason they do it, they're doing it, they're not really concerned or worried or interested in the fact that, oh, some people don't want to vaccinate. That's not, it's not a feature of what they're thinking about. So for that reason, either from the beginning of the policies, which was the case in your state of California, or in some other states, the minute people start kind of kicking off a bit and going, oh, we don't want to vaccinate, the states are quite quick to go, right, fine, okay, you can have a non-medical exemption. Because they were never, you know, they were never really worried about those people, and there weren't very many of them. So having these non-medical exemptions makes the policies non-contentious, which is exactly what the people who are bringing them in want. Um, so to be very clear, these mandates that are ubiquitous in every state were not introduced to try and overcome vaccine refusal. And so it's really important to understand non-medical exemptions as, as part of that project, right? And just to reiterate that a bit, we have some former directors of the National Immunisation Programme explaining, I'm not going to read these, you can read them yourselves, but basically really showing that, number one, you know, we want to hook on to school enrolment because it's something that we can rely on happening every year. We don't need to pay for it. And here we really see what we would now call in today's language a nudge. So policymakers were seeking to nudge people, nudge busy parents, make sure this gets to the top of their list of things to do. Again, it was not about coercing people or thinking about people that don't want to. So that's, you know, it's all well and good to have those intentions. And I think the policies largely worked as intended for, for many years. 
But what we study in, in California, and this is in the book, but it's also in an article that hopefully will be out um, early next year as well, the non-medical exemptions start to do a few other things that maybe we might not expect. One of the things that, as you can probably imagine, if you've been able to access a non-medical exemption in California since the 1960s, since as long as the mandates have been around, you would start to think that the exemption is doing something pretty special. It's basically the government telling you that this is your decision. Sure, there's a mandate. Sure, most people should be vaccinating. But you also have a very protected opportunity to not vaccinate, which you could very easily understand to be a right or a protection of a right. So the refusers are really going, yeah, well, you know, the government said we don't have to do it. Like, that's protecting us. We're really, we're really passionate about that. But then what happens is that there comes this new generation of parents in particular, but also policymakers, who start to go you know what, there's a mandate and that looks like a rule for everybody, but yet there's that group of people over there and they don't have to do it and that doesn't really seem fair. And as I'll talk about, especially in the context of disease outbreaks, the exemption starts to look like an aberration. It starts to look like a corruption of a pure policy. So if the mandate was for everybody, why have we got this thing over here letting people not do it? Um, so follow those away because we'll come back to them. But we, I just want to explain a few more ideas about how non-medical exemptions became a focus for policymakers. So since the 1990s, and look, probably before that, but scholars to my understanding weren't looking at it yet, there have been lots of bills in various American states seeking to either make these non-medical exemptions easier to get or harder to get. So, you know, and, and that's just bills, like they don't always pass, but there have been efforts to sort of change these policies over the, over the years, trying to perhaps make it more difficult for people to get out of it or easier to get out of it. And one of the things that policymakers started to realise is that sometimes the policies made it easier to get an exemption than it was to get a vaccine. Think about it. You've got to take your kid to get vaccinated quite a few times. You know, you've got to take time off work. Um, it's, you know, they're a bit like it's not convenient necessarily. Or you can just turn up at the school counter and go, yeah, sorry, I don't want to do it. And, and you've got an exemption. So people might do that just because it's easier. And so um, pretty soon some bright sparks realised that you would perhaps want to intervene in that policy design process and say, well, let's try and have a default where it's easier to get vaccinated than it is to get an exemption. Let's use some hurdles to put in the way of the non-medical exemption. And so combined with the period in which the behavioural insights, the idea of nudging really starts to take off globally, we see policymakers really think about how do we do that? How do we make the default vaccination and then make the exemption harder to get, but not impossible? And they choose to use education and they get excited about that because they think that the education might actually work. So the education might be, as in California, as in Washington State, before the policy change we're talking about, uh, you would have to go and see a clinician who would sign off a piece of paper saying, yes, I've spoken to you. Yes, I've told you it's a bad idea. Maybe I might not tell you that if you found one that agrees with you, but the idea is they're supposed to tell you, you know, why you should do it, but signing off on your kind of informed refusal, if you like. So um, the other thing they did, in, like in Michigan, they did classes. So if you want an exemption, fine, you've got to sit through, you know, hours of, of learning about the science of vaccination. And at the end of it, you can have your exemption if you still want it. Now, policymakers in Michigan were so excited when they did that, that they thought, let's make the parents bring their kids and we'll vaccinate the kids after the session. Not many kids got vaccinated. But the policy still worked because it wasn't so much the education that changed people's behaviour, but the burden. It was changing the choice architecture. It was very clever nudging. And so they get excited about that. Policymakers get excited about that and they're like, yes, let's, um, let's do these clever policies. Um, and they did that here in California um, in 2012. They borrowed a policy from Washington State, who'd already done it, and you had to go and see the provider and get your um, form signed. But they found that this actually didn't have enough of an effect as they would have liked. Um, it didn't reduce exemption rates by very much, and it did almost nothing in communities where vaccine refusers live together. And I've lived in these communities. People are not there going, oh, like rural vaccine refusers, let's hang out together but they share a lot of common values and identities. And it's very, it's amazing being part of one of these communities. Um, and so you want to live with people like you, um, but in doing so, we have been communities with very low vaccine coverage rates. 
Um, and of course, they are a disease um, outbreak risk for people in those communities. And so um, the policymakers who were involved in this legislation, including um, Chris Calvin, who was the um, American Academy of Pediatrics California chapters uh, director, they're basically pointing out, look, they're not changing the behaviour of those I don't want to people, the committed refusers. These policies are not changing. Yes, they'll go talk to their physician, then they'll just keep doing right what they were doing before. <clears throat> but then something else happens. And so that thing that happens is the measles outbreak that occurred at Disneyland um, in 2014-15. And this was a real game changer. This was a catalyzing event, as we would say, in the policy literature. So what happens? Um, Previously, there had been outbreaks of measles um, in California the years before, the years after, with about the same number of cases. We're talking in the 200s here. So it's not like there were more cases coming out of Disneyland, but it was really, really high profile. Basically, someone, probably someone from overseas, brings measles to Disneyland, but there's enough unvaccinated or undervaccinated Californians at Disneyland that this then becomes a local problem. This then starts spreading and you know, now we all know what contact tracing is and what it looks like to wonder if you've been exposed. But, you know, this this is like 20, 2015, 2014, and pa parents have, have had to think about this before. And now it's like, you know, did you catch the BART on X date? Did you eat at X restaurant on that date? And people are now really getting worried about the fact that there's not enough community protection, vaccination rates are not high enough, and we're at risk. So people start thinking about what to do, and pretty soon they know what to do, which is to contact this guy. So this is Dr Pan. He was the assembly person who was responsible for that previous bit of legislation I talked about that made you go and see a clinician before you got a non-medical exemption. Um, and now everyone's contacting Dr Pan, who is now a senator, saying we really want to um, change this policy in a more drastic way. And so he is kind of the instigator of that with, with a group of other people, which I'll talk about a bit more, but that's how we kind of see this happening. But people will sometimes say, oh, you know, Disneyland caused California's policy change. And, and we argue in the book that it was actually quite a bit more complicated than that. There was definitely more, more going on. But before we explore that, let's just talk about what the policy change was. So non-medical exemptions go from being something you have to get signed off by a clinician to something you cannot have at all. Now, if you don't want to vaccinate your kid, you'd better hope that you can find a medical provider who will say they cannot vaccinate the kid for medical reasons, or if your child has a disability and is protected under federal law, uh, you may also be able to get away with it. As I will talk about, there are probably some other ways you can enrol your unvaccinated kid, but this is what's supposed to happen. Now, SB 277, or the uh, Non-Medical Exemptions Bill, as we call it, um, was a huge deal because it was the first effort in the United States to eliminate non-medical exemptions to tackle the perceived problem of vaccine refusal. Now, Mississippi and West Virginia are two American states that did not have um, non-medical exemptions for a very, very long time. We're talking decades. But again, that was not a kind of policy setting that arose from a sense of like, oh, yeah, we'll make people vaccinate so there's no vaccine refusers. There's, there's a whole story as to why those states are the way they are. There's a wonderful article which you can send to anyone who wants to read it. I didn't write it. Um, but what we see with SB 277 is really the first modern attempt to go, we're going to we're gonna change these non-medical exemptions with the hope of changing the behaviour of vaccine refusers. And it's also noteworthy because it's the first major reform to vaccination war in America that was not led only by public health officials. So I showed you Dr Pan earlier. For that 2012 clinician counselling piece where they're going to be clever and have a nudge and set the default as vaccination. You know, he works with um, other legislators and he works with California's Immunisation Coalition and the County Health Officers Association and all these people who are like technical experts. But the, the only parents we see involved in that are the anti-vaccine or vaccine refusing or hesitant parents who are there going, no, don't do it. We're going to protest. We're going to bring Andrew Wakefield to town. We're, you know, we're going to like, um, you know, we're going to get people, you know, rallying against it. So the public face of vaccination in 2012 um, is, is, is a face of non-vaccination and vaccine refusal. And that, was a, that really changed with Senate Bill 277. For the first time, we see mobilised pro-vaccine parents who are this group called Vaccinate California. So this is a picture of some of them. And, they, you know, these 
we have to pay attention to these people because they are a really an incredible accomplished group of people. They're basically like career superstar people, very clever, highly educated people who have either taken a break out of their career to have kids or perhaps haven't, you know, have kids and are still working. But they've got a bit of time and they've got a bit of fire in their bellies and they're passionate. And they're the kind of people who are perhaps used to the idea that society should kind of work for people like them. And I say that as someone who is, is like them. And you have a sense of like, yeah, things should be kind of set up in a way that, that works and that works for me because I'm doing the right thing, I'm vaccinating my kids. And what happens with some of these mums is they have experiences in their social lives as parents of little kids where they get exposed to people who don't vaccinate and their kids are not old enough to be vaccinated and they're, they're you know, so it's, it's very personal and, and they feel this real threat from vaccine refusal. And it makes them really angry because they're like, you know, hang on, it feels like everything's set up for the refuser's benefit. They can get this non-medical exemption, they can enrol in school, um, in California as well. There's a whole, you know, the kind of granola identity is quite big in some communities. So you're very kind of loud and proud about it. You're not kind of being quiet about it. And so and so all of that starts to make the non-medical exemption really look like an aberration to these people. And I talked about that earlier. And because of who they are, because of the amazing skills they have, they are able to mount this incredible campaign to do something much more radical than what Dr. Tan and his colleagues have done in 2012 and actually get rid of the exemptions altogether. And so that's exactly what they do. But in doing so, of course, they run into conflict with the vaccine refusers who, as I mentioned, really think that this um, non-medical exemption was about protecting their rights. And they are not, you know, you can take those rights out of my cold dead hand. You're, you know, you're not, you're not taking them easily. But the uh, vaccine, the Vaccinate California people and their allies, and again, you know, working with these very accomplished technical experts and um, elected officials, they win the day. And so this becomes law in California. And so there's definitely a success story to come out of this in terms of changing the social meaning of vaccine refusal. Now, unless you are, you know, a, a Gen Xer like me, you might not know who some of these celebrities are, but these are people who are very big in the early 2000s. Um, we've got Jenny McCarthy, we've got Alicia Silverstone, Mandy Alex. So these are all people who um, were out and proud about not vaccinating their kids according to the schedule or in some cases not at all. Um, and they tended to get really positive receptions. You know, they would go on talk shows. They're getting audiences for these ideas, which is not great in terms of, you know, these ideas propagating when they're not based on science. So we certainly had, um, we certainly had a, a previously quite welcome reception for celebrities and, and, and you know, non-vaccinating people in kind of polite society. And SB277 really changed that. Um, so there were, SB 277 wasn't the end of this policy change in the questions. Perhaps I can talk to you a bit more about the 2019 medical exemptions bill because they went in and tightened those too. Um, but in some of the subsequent policy skirmishes in this state, we see a really different response to famous vaccine refusers. And the actor Rob Schneider lost a lucrative sponsorship deal for his views. In 2019, when I was actually here doing the fieldwork for the book, um, Jessica Beale, um, oppose this, this tightening of medical exemptions that would make it harder again for parents to get out of vaccinating. And, you know, she did not get a very positive reception. She was basically roundly, roundly condemned. Um, and no one, when she, when she went to Sacramento, like no one except, you know, a couple of Republicans there, no one wanted to talk to her. No one wanted to kind of give her that audience anymore. So the, the social media of vaccine refusal had really changed in a big way because of the narrative that those vaccinated California parents used. And it was a very powerful narrative. They talked a lot about schools as the kind of networked heart of communities and the right of people who have um, health conditions, who they can't be vaccinated or they're undergoing cancer treatment. Um, and not just kids, by the way, but also teachers and parents and bus drivers and you know all the people that might need schools to be a place where you won't catch measles, right? So. They really um, use a very powerful narrative that got everybody thinking about those people and their rights. And I think that was a very powerful way of changing the conversation about vaccine refusal in this country. So the other success we can talk about is SB 277, the um, non-medical exemption bill, 
certainly also raised vaccine coverage rates. And, you know, you can see this, the headlines here. But if you drill in a little bit closer, um, there was actually a replacement effect um, that some scholars found um, subsequently afterwards where, now this is a bit complicated, but I'll just try and talk through it super quick. Um, the big yellow group is people that were enrolled in school without being fully vaccinated. Um, so that so they, they kind of maybe shouldn't that maybe shouldn't have happened, but it, it does happen. And so that's where we see this real drop in um, the number of kids. This is showing you the number of unvaccinated kids in California. And then if you look at the purple line, that is our non-medical exemption. So these are the refusers, right? And what we start to see is, um, sure, like the purple line goes down to nothing because you can't have a non-medical exemption, but what is the blue and red and green? What's going on there? And these basically become other categories of still being able to be unvaccinated and enrolled that the families migrate into. Notably, uh, medical exemption in green gets bigger, this other exempt category or being overdue. So you basically, like, as you can see, it's still not really changing the behaviour of these groups that, that um, was the target group, which was the, the refuser. And in a way, the, the improvements that we see in the tan colour is really about schools doing better paperwork and reporting their stats more effectively to, to the um, health officials. Get those emotions. So we need to, you know, so keeping that in mind, we need to then kind of zoom out and go, okay, well, what else happened in the wake of this policy change? What else has it caused? What else has it done? So one of the things that happens is it definitely acts as a blueprint for policymakers and community members in other states to go, right, like, let's follow what California did, which from what I gather is a bit of a theme in this country. Um, so we see some other states adopt similar policies. I will point out that all of these states have trifecta Democrats governments when they do so. So this is something you can do when you've got um, a democratic, um, you know, control of the state and when they're committed to doing so and want it to happen. Um, and there are ongoing efforts, you know, to, to do likewise. So it doesn't, doesn't work everywhere. They don't, they, don't, they don't carry the day everywhere, but some places do. Um, as late as 2021, these policies were still changing. Um, but, and I, and I already talked about how major physician organisations have now made it their policy that this is what every state should be doing. But we need to think a little bit about what we're asking every state to do. And Mark and I argue in the book that we're really looking at injecting coercion into a policy that was not designed to be coercive. And we've talked about that already in terms of like how they were designed to get needles into arms in the context of kind of not enough resources for the state to do it in other ways. Um, but now it's like, no, let's, the, the purpose of a mandate should be to make people vaccinate. Let's get rid of the non-medical exemption, which radically changes how vaccine mandates work in this country and, and kind of the purpose and, and function of them. Instead of nudging people towards vaccination, they basically coerce you and tell you you're going to have to choose between vaccinating, which you don't want to do, um, or your kid going to school. And parents um, have been willing to saying, well, I'm not going to do that, so it looks like my kid's not going to school. So um, this is a threat to make you substantially worse off if you don't comply. There, is, there were real teeth here. There is a real consequence here now. So there's a couple of implications of that that we need to think through. Um, as a vaccine refuser who, you know, these, many of these people are very, very committed to their views. They, this is a huge part of their identity. So their experience of these new kinds of policies is that, that the policies actually inconsistent with their fundamental values and hence the policy is illegitimate and now this is kind of going into the sort of new work that Mark and I are kind of inspired to do particularly out of we spent last week in um, Northern California doing book talks and um, we've, we're kind of going deeper into this now um, but this idea of illegitimacy is, is, is very dangerous because it's contagious so you know it's, it's an idea that can spread and it's very toxic to a political system because it's basically not just me saying, I think that's a bad policy. I mean, we could have a conversation about in this room about taxation and how much people should be taxed at different income levels. And we might feel very strongly about that. But I don't think any of us would sort of say, oh, well, just because I don't like it, um, therefore the government should, you know, has no right to exist or to do that stuff. But when we're talking about this level of illegitimacy um, in the context of vaccine mandates that people think are actually chipping away at their um, fundamental values, um, people may very well say, I don't actually think the state has that power over me, like I don't recognise it. 
And we certainly saw this during COVID-19, not just with vaccination policies, but with other interventions as well. And so here's the thing. If you're there going to the state, I don't recognise you as legitimate. The state can't do anything. The, the state can't say, well, I'm the state and you have to recognise me because I don't and I haven't. So the state can't kind of respond to that question or challenge to its legitimacy. It can't resolve those questions. So we actually um, potentially have quite a big problem on our hands. So what else happens? One of the things that we argue has come out of this, um, this policy change in California is it's really cemented political polarisation on having mandates without exemptions. Democrats support the policies like this and Republicans will either seek to protect the non-medical exemptions that are in place or perhaps to enlarge and expand the ones on offer. I'm just going to show you a little bit to show you about this political polarisation. So this is 2015 um, 16 session. This is the votes for SB 277, the, the big policy change we talked about. You get a couple of Republicans voting for it, and you get some um, Democrats voting against it as well, by the way. So it's it's definitely polarised, but um, not entirely. 2019, the crackdown on the medical exemptions bill, which we haven't talked much about, now we're seeing no Republicans voting for it, um, much more strongly polarised um, than we saw previously, or maybe not much more, but certainly more, more polarised. Um, and this is risky. So um, the law professor... Dan Kahan wrote this, he did some really great work about 10 years ago, looking at how um, at that time everyone was saying, oh, you know, vaccination caught up in the culture wars. We didn't even call them culture wars then, but that's what we meant. And it was like, oh, if you know what someone's views are about abortion or which party they vote for or what they think about, you know, environment, you could also predict their views on vaccination. So Dan Kahan did this work and was like, no, you can't. You actually can't. There wasn't a cultural cleavage on vaccination at that time. There was a cleavage on views on policies, but not on vaccines themselves. So Dan Kahan did something very important. He issued a warning. He said, be really careful about tinkering and mucking about with these mandate policies, because you may very well set in train polarisation that doesn't yet exist. And... Um, that advice really wasn't heeded, and I, and I understand that. Like, I'm not against what the Vaccinate California mums and the policymakers in this state did. I think they were really seeking to make their state safer for people, and that's something that I would back and support. The problem, though, is that in doing so, they may have set in motion um, the, something that then was definitely enhanced throughout COVID-19, which is this polarisation, not just about vaccination policy, which maybe we can handle, maybe we can't, but about vaccines themselves. And by the time vaccines themselves become a polarising topic, we're in trouble because for diseases like measles, you need 95% of the population vaccinated and you cannot afford for that to be split along party lines. So we argue in the book that this is going to generate serious implications for America's ability as a, as a country to govern vaccine acceptance. Only states with trifecta democratic government can actually abolish non-medical exemptions. People can try elsewhere, but it's not going to happen. The biggest problem is that the US doesn't have any other way of doing this. Like, look at those policymakers we talked about in the 1960s, and they're like, okay, you know, let's, let's do it this way because we don't really have any other way. We don't have the resources. We don't have the federal funding. So let's, you know, let's do it this way. Um, so there's not really... And, and, and an effective alternative. Um, there's not the resourcing, for example, of big communication campaigns. Like you might see civil society do a bit, you might see pharma do a bit, but government's not throwing lots of money at persuasion, which they do in other countries, right? As part of my research, you know, studied a big campaign in Australia and a big campaign in France that went along with their new mandates, were, which were about winning hearts and minds. That's not happening in this country. So you've either got mandates or you've got mandates that don't work or don't exist anymore. Now, of course, all of this gets worse in COVID-19. And one of the things to point out here is that some of the same actors that were involved in resisting the California policy changes for the childhood vaccine mandates went on to play roles in resisting various um, health protection measures in this stage, including um, before the vaccine, but of course, once they were here, shutting down Dodger Stadium, 
Um, and some of the same actors also involved in storming the capital. So we see these people kind of awakening to resist the childhood policy change, and then they go on to keep, you know, doing this kind of work. Um, we also saw, and this is the work that Mark and I and some others did, uh, we looked at what legislators were doing in various American states um, earlier in the pandemic to legislate around vaccine mandates. And this is before we, um, you know, before we've got vaccine mandates in many cases, but legislators are trying to bring in um, laws that will stop mandates from happening to preemptively stop governments from mandating. And that can even be around things like, well, we'll stop the data collection that will be able to show who's vaccinated. We won't let you set up a registry to show who's vaccinated or not. One In one state, there was even an effort to prevent people working for the government from promoting and recommending COVID-19 vaccines. So we're not talking about mandating them anymore. We're talking about efforts to prevent people even recommending them. I'm sure many of you know this already, but political party identity is now the best single predictor of whether someone is vaccinated against COVID-19 or not. So we've definitely seen polarisation on COVID-19 vaccines. Um, we're still kind of watching and waiting to, to see the spillover for childhood vaccines. But there is certainly, so this is now since the book came out, um, we, we argue in the book that people will um, we, we'll kind of see this trend continuing. Uh, Democrat-led states, people are going to try and get rid of the exemptions, and Republican-led states, they're going to try and expand them. And we've seen it already happen. So in Mississippi, um, where which was one of those two states that had not had exemptions for a really long time, uh, there was a... A, an exemption that was overturned in 1970 by a judge. And then this year in April, another judge who was a, a Republican um, appointee uh, reinstated the religious exemption in that state. So he brought it back. In Montana, there's a new exemption coming for uh, daycare. So for um, not for school, but for daycare. So that, uh, making it easier to enroll unvaccinated kids in daycare. And of course, um, you guys have an election coming up next year, lucky you. Um, and so, you know, the Republican presidential primary candidates have all taken this position of being critical of the removal of non-medical exemptions. So this is something you can expect to see more of in the coming months. So in this context, we are concerned that Americans' community protection looks bleak. Republicans, we think, will keep doing what we've already described, which will lead to lower immunisation rates in their states. And in that context, and not just in those states, of course, but everywhere, because people, you know, move around, um, public health institutions are going to have to start using some of the lessons they developed during COVID and preparing for outbreaks of diseases that we have vaccines that are effective against but will not be in use sufficiently. So we're going to see more outbreaks of diseases that we use to control. And um, this means that private institutions should be planning their own disease control measures. So universities, businesses, now not all businesses will want to do it for ideological reasons, but those that can may need to actually have their own vaccine requirements for their workers or maybe even their clients. And not just um, private institutions, but also governance at the level of families. So we predict that um, families are going to have to work out how to respond to this stuff. And it's going to have, um, it's going to cause like social tears within communities around, well, will people who are vaccinated want to be around people who don't vaccinate their children? We already see that some new parents make you vaccinate before you visit the new baby so you're not bringing any diseases in. We can see that kind of thing expanding and, and not just lasting in the period that, that the child is a newborn. Um, so, and this is really going to be in response to, well, the government can't protect us anymore from vaccine preventable diseases so we're going to have to protect ourselves. So on that really um, joyful note um, I've pretty much reached the end of my talk. I will put this slide back up but just to let you know um, I've got copies of the book for sale today if anyone would like to buy one. They're $25 uh, which is a special price. Um, you can also order them online with um, a promotional code um, which will save you some money but um, you will still have to pay postage if you buy online. Um, super quick slide just to show my social science methods, which I won't talk through, but I can put up if anybody wants to see them. Um, and finally, my acknowledgement slide to um, thank everyone here today, and especially Rich for hosting me. 
um, the participants in the research, my wonderful co-author Mark, and a couple of um, amazing prof colleagues who have been very helpful in me doing this research, uh, and yeah, all of you, and the Australian government. So thank you, and I'd like to hear your questions. Thank you. Um, when, when to you, but I'll, I'll handle the, uh, the questions. We also have some online uh, uh, questions as well. But um, start with start with the room. I'll I'll, I'll just pick the thoughts on you. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Just one, one, just a quick question. So for the people on Zoom, the, 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 if, yes, if possible, I think. Oh, here, 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 we'll, here we'll do this then. I'll I'll run around in the audience. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for the topic. That's excellent. Um, one thing that you didn't discuss is homeschooling, which, of course, homeschooling in, in a way is, is is an expression of illegitimacy of, of, of the publicly provided school, but it's also a way to avoid these. And I, I suspect in the figures that you showed, what you were showing was the rates of compliance within schools. So we're missing that as, as homeschooling has increased, which is now up to a little over 5% of United States students are or homeschool. So could you talk about that? Yeah, great. And um, thank you for sharing that statistic. When Mark and I were finalizing the book, we went looking for what the stats were for homeschooling in California. We couldn't find them. Mm -hmm. That said, they made this somewhere that we couldn't find. So you're absolutely right. This, the slide was only showing compliance in a school setting. Um, people, you know, and, and for, it's actually important as well to note that the policymakers all said, you know, we weren't requiring people to vaccinate. And they very much talked about homeschooling as the opt out of your life. Um, and so, and say, and, and, and they would also say, and that like that's kind of okay because they really focused on schools at the site that they needed to make safe. So, you know, you don't want to be part of it, it's fine, but you don't get to come. And that same kind of, um, I've noticed that same kind of language on the field work I've been doing on this trip as well. So when they sort of say, you know, if you need to be vaccinated to go to work at a, at a hospital, um, we're not saying, you know, you have to be vaccinated. We're saying if you want to come to work and be in contact with vulnerable people, you know, you can't do that if you're not vaccinated. Now, you know, whether whether you do or don't think that that's kind of, you know, a bit merely now about whether it is actually a requirement or not, but um, certainly that's that's the argument. So to go back to your point, yes, I, I imagine the stats, if we could find them, would show more people homeschooling. Um Yes, also agree that, that that the decision to homeschool more broadly is is probably an expression of, you know, that you see just as illegitimate. Yeah, thank you. Good afternoon. This was a great talk. Um, I just have a quick question about um, misinformation on vaccines. So let's. So if you are already someone who presupposes that the state is illegitimate. And that, I assume that also means that you presuppose that medical institutions are Ill illegitimate as well. So then how would we in this new age combat misinformation specifically um, if you feel where, because if the state is saying that is saying legitimate informa medical information, but they're not believing it because they don't believe the state, then what would be the best way forward to approach vaccine misinformation? Great question. There's a reason that Mark and I wrote a chapter 10 that's like full of really, really gloomy predictions. Chapter 10 of the book is supposed to be about what to do, like what's the fix. And we don't see one yet that is. So the problem is exactly as you describe, and it's real. I think the best we can be doing, perhaps to, to use an analogy from the vaccination world, is, is in that realm of prevention. So some psychologists have shown, for example, that you can inoculate people against misinformation by teaching them about the techniques that they can expect to encounter. And then people get really excited because it's like, you know, there's that, nothing better than that feeling that you're outsmarting the people that are trying to coerce and control you. So I think there is an element there that we can build not just on people's, um, like we can build on people's agency and people's de desire to be autonomous and not be kind of, you know, controlled and tricked and coerced by, by that information. Um, but once somebody does believe that, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right, the legitimacy crisis is, is big and there's not anybody that can actually change that person's mind except because they've signed up to their own influences, they've signed up to their own alternative um, health practitioners. And you, you can always find, you know, a few people with letters after their name that will validate those positions. Um, but this, you know, this is a, one of the big challenges of our age. There is not, in my mind, a solution at this point. Thank you.
Is it okay? Great. Okay. Um, so I've been doing some research on like school choice programs in private schools. Have you seen that private like have you seen that private schools usually fall under these mandates, or do they have their own like private mandate that they enforce? Or is that kind of a hole in the mandate? Great question. So the mandates um, at a state level are supposed to cover all schools, charter schools, private schools, state schools, public schools. Um, what ends up happening, though, and this is something Mark and I drilled into a bit more in the book, and certainly, again, in a different setting, something I've drilled into on this trip in the field work I've been doing, is the state can say whatever it wants. You know, what actually matters is what's going to happen at the school. Now, what's going to happen at the school for the private schools is they have a stronger incentive than the public schools to admit unvaccinated or undervaccinated children because um, it's, it's got a financial implication for them if they exclude the children. Um, and that may be true also of state schools and public schools, but, but less so. But the private schools, you know, if they're, if they're running on tight margins, you know, kicking these kids out or not letting them in might be the difference between being able to keep your doors open or not. So one of the big problems at all schools is are these mandates actually enforced? And the fact that you saw all these other kind of weird categories that probably shouldn't really exist or shouldn't be that big, and yet that seems to be the categories where the um, people who previously held non-medical exemptions are going, um, we see like a, a big enforcement problem that is bigger at private schools because of the financial motivation. So California is very diverse. I mean, if you went from the coast all the way east, you know, things changed, especially politically. So the west, the west coast is very blue, for example. But as you go like east of here, except for the little oasis in Palm Springs, it's pretty red. So how did that factor into your analysis when you, you know, when you're doing your research? Yeah, good. So, I mean, we weren't doing kind of county by county analysis ourselves. We've been looking at work other people have done, and thankfully people have done some good scholarship in this state. So um, I don't recall seeing anything that particularly was looking at, you know, county by voting preference, for example, and county by, you know, numbers of unvaccinated people. Um, I guess what I will say is that, you know, when... Yeah, that those regions matter and, and will, will matter to the sort of legitimacy of policy in those regions. But again, by the time the policy is being made at a state level, those red regions are, are numerically not very significant. So they will have implementation problems again. And again, we could expect um, them to have, you know, a lower will to implement. Um, but... But yeah, it doesn't stop the policies getting made, but it probably stops them being effective in those places. <clears throat> Keep continuing with politics um, and, and going to COVID. Um, the, the federal government mandated, uh, as, as I understand it, uh, that federal employees, the military, um, get um, vaccinated. Mm -hmm. Um, and then that led, it seems, to the backlash and turning it into a cultural war. And so if you look at death rates uh, post-vaccine and you line up death rates by color, blue or red, the red states had much higher death rates. Mm -hmm. So I'm thinking that, that the, the mandates creating the backlash has put us into a terrible uh, position if it ever comes a, a even more serious than COVID, a, a flu um, uh, that is maybe sitting around in the birds right now, um, trying to uh, mutate. Um, so, you said you looked at the other countries too. Has there been any backlash on COVID uh, from the uh, widespread vaccinations on COVID at all, or is the experience of other countries far different than here in the United States? Look, it's a great question. The research that I'm doing on COVID is, is quite new, like um, the project I'm doing started in October. So although I've been following it as an interested scholar, I haven't been, you know, rigorously collecting data. I've just been taking information in. I mean, what I will say is that, you know, other plenty of other places mandated, like continental Europe, you know, especially Italy and France. I mean, my, my argument is that anywhere that's mandated stuff for childhood is pretty quick to do it for COVID, but I haven't seen any study that actually has looked, and something I'd like to do, that traces the pre-existing childhood policies for every country in the world and then what do they do for COVID. Um, 
but in the absence of that, I would say, like, yes, there has been backlash in, in other places, but nothing like the backlash that we've seen here in terms of the, the, the deep politicisation and polarisation. And as you say, um, I mean, I don't want to blame mandates. And, and in fact, we, it, it's good. People have pushed Mark and myself on this talk around, on this, you know, this book tour around, you know, the other factors that have contributed to politicisation and polarisation. And some people say, oh, you know, there's, you know, colourful news mandates have nothing to do with it. And there's certainly a lot more drivers. Um, it, even, I, I agree that the federal mandates are going to be a big source of backlash, but even then there is going to be stuff beyond that that is generating this politicisation. So I'm, I'm reluctant to kind of draw a causal line between one and the other, but on the other hand, I think we have to talk about it. I think we have to talk about whether 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 we might think that it's part of the problem, even though um, it was perhaps necessary um, in, in, you know, and, and certainly as well, like, you know, I was with Richard Pan earlier in this trip last week and, you know, spending time talking with him, I was so struck by how passionate he was as a policymaker. You love him or hate him, he's very driven, he's very sure of his beliefs. And um, I kind of thought, and he, and he was talking about what was right for California. And I was like, that's exactly how Californians should want him to think. But what does that mean for America? What does that mean for the rest of the country? And that's such a that's such an awful thing to have to think about when you're making policies at a state level for your own state, for your own people. You probably don't want to have to think about what they mean for other places. But I'm not sure that we live in a world where we can't think about that anymore. Quick follow-up. The culture of California is that we want the other states to uh, follow us. You look at our clean air, uh, our AB32, which is the climate change initiative. What happens in California first happens elsewhere, and Californians recognize that. So, in fact, they, they think of it as a positive. But I but I think maybe the last five to eight years has got California maybe rethinking that from a strategy point of view. I think that's really interesting. And, yeah, how... How interesting and in many ways sad to sort of have to do that soul searching because this, yeah, this state has led not just your country but the world in so many disciplines from, you know, culture to, yeah, to environment to, to yeah, all the things. I don't need to listen to you. Um, yeah, I will be interested to keep in touch with you all and hear how it goes. <laughs> Just to stay on to that too, I mean, I'm thinking too, where uh, of, of sort of the follow the leadership sort of angle of it. Then, you know, subsequent to SB 276, you had what, New York, Massachusetts, Maine, Washington, kind of at least try to follow, but at least, you know, again, on the more on the, uh, you know, the kind of more of the, on the political lines of, uh, but even that wasn't, that was kind of ugly. You know, yeah. In a sense of uh, New Jersey failed. Uh, with that. Yeah, absolutely. There were places where it did did and didn't work. And and certainly one of the arguments is how successful things were was determined by how involved you have those pro-vaccine parents as being. So it's it's kind of quite widely recognised that if you don't have that really visible public support and that really visible narrative of this is why, like this is why parents are willing to say to other parents, no, I am going to kind of ask that you be vaccinated and get the state to stand behind that. Without that, it's, it's it's quite difficult to get these changes. Okay. I was going to ask, too, even though these mandates are clearly trying to um, put these preventative measures in place, could it also be really insensitive for, like, the history of vaccines and, like, just the history of, like, government experiments on people who were um, coming from these are um, minority communities that were clearly affected by these types of vaccine experiments. Absolutely. And I think that that's something that hasn't been kind of thought about in a great deal. And certainly if you look at the, the two sides of the vaccine wars at a, at a parent level in California, it's people that look like me on both sides. It's, it's kind of privileged people on both sides. So I think um, I think underserved communities or historically abused marginalised communities um, certainly need to be thought about and considered in these policies. Um, there's a nice article that came out, I think, last year by Jennifer Reich and I think Courtney Thornton was her co-author, and they kind of look at um, they look at vaccine refusal through the lens of um, of race in particular, and certainly um, show that it's harder to get out of not vaccinating 
if you don't look like me. Um, and, and that through a range of things, that's through like kind of social capital, um, it's through the way that people, it, 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 it's how do you, you know, we, we looked at all those weird categories that people seem to migrate into, but like how do you know how to get into one of them? Yeah, how do, and how do you know which doctor is going to give you a medical exemption that you don't really deserve? So I don't think I fully answered your question, but I probably talked around it a bit. <laughs> I hope that was enough. <laughs> um, out of, from the mandates of federal employee, military, and those vaccine departments or mandates, have you seen like any type of, or do you happen to know like the severity of the backlash from those? Because I imagine like government agencies or the military might be a bit more educated when it comes to vaccines. Uh, I only know a few stories from my colleagues about uh, backlash like that. I know at least in the military, I don't know that too much backlash, but of course it could be impacted of where I am. Uh, do you happen to know anything about that? Look, again, I mean, I followed your country with interest, but from afar and only through the news at this point, and also whilst following many other countries, including my own. So can't really speak to the scale of that backlash, but, but one thing I will say is that in, in my state of Western Australia, our government basically required people to be vaccinated with no opt-out other than a medical exemption, which is really hard to get, really tightly regulated. Um, so vaccines are required for all of our frontline workers, you know, teachers, ambulance drivers, um, health workers, obviously, but also people working in grocery stores, kids working in McDonald's, they all had to be vaccinated. Um, it covered 75% of our working population in Western Australia. Now, as you can imagine as well, in, in every single one of those occupations, there are people who didn't want to do it. Um, I went on a TV show where I met, I was on a panel, and I don't usually do stuff like this. I wouldn't do it for childhood, but I did do it for COVID. You know, I don't usually want to debate the vaccine refusal, but I think in COVID it was very reasonable to do that and very important to do that. And so the people that were on the other side were, um, there was a teacher, a nurse, and a police officer who had all lost their jobs. So the educated thing I'm not so sure about. And these people were smart and they were eloquent and actually ended up having quite a rapport with the teacher and we kind of stayed in touch. Um, but yeah, they they held their views very, very deeply. And yeah, I mean, you guys have probably all encountered it. They'll talk about the, the Pfizer report or, you know, they'll, they'll have their things that they think are persuasive and convincing. And then, you know, and if you don't know them, then you don't you don't know what you're talking about. Thank you. Um, I also had a follow up to a question about um, like marginalized communities. I remember um, like last, or I guess like two summers now ago, I did some research on, um, I'm not sure if you know like East Palo Alto, which is a community where there's not a lot of people that are white or like affluent. And the um, when we did interventions, like make um, a lot of people who live there only speak Spanish or um, they work full time jobs. So during COVID, they did um, have access to like the max, like the max vaccination sites that were only open Monday through Friday during working hours, and they had to have a car to get there, etc. So we did a lot of um, like clinic pop ups that were on the weekend that were like that had like students who could speak Spanish from the community. And by doing that, we were able to like raise the vaccination rate in the city from like 60 to like around 90 something percent. And so I'm wondering like how much of, I remember I saw the graph where there was like the gray area of people who went from unvaccinated to vaccinated and there was still like the exemption chunk, but there was also like the, the chunk that really decreased, which was the gray part. I'm wondering like um, what percentage of the people do we know who are currently unvaccinated or actual like active anti-vaxxers versus people who actually just don't have access to vaccines or have a history of, for example, not um, being very like in a population that was accessible to vaccines mm -hmm. until now? Thank you for your great question and thank you for your service during the pandemic. Well done. Um, so I would say that one of the challenges when you remove an on medical exemption, and this happened in my own country too, is you actually stop being able to track um, or have a bit of a proxy for tracking attitudes, right? You just have a bunch of people who are not fully vaccinated. Now, you might drill into them a little bit more and you might say, well, some of them are partially vaccinated, so maybe we could surmise that they are people who are having more access and systemic barriers rather than refusers. But again, we still can't really be sure. So I think, um, and a related challenge, of course, and, and again, back to enforcement, and it, you could look at this both ways. So you might say that, Oh, if you're kind of if it's a school in quite a you know challenged community, maybe they're not going to enforce super strict out of 
the kids' interests, right? These kids should be in school. We want the kids in school and their parents aren't committed refusers, so let's let them in and hopefully then they'll get caught up. But, oh, we don't have the resources to keep following up and saying, well, have you done it yet? Um, or we do and they haven't, but we don't want to keep them out because they're here. So there's all these reasons why um, if you were for if, if you were in a community that was quite a deprived community, um, the educational institution might have some incentives not to implement that, that were based on the welfare and best interests of the kids from an educational perspective, but then those kids are not, they're also missing out on getting vaccinated. So there's, I can tell you an Australian example that might also shed a bit of light on this. When Australian states brought in their, their um, early education and care mandates, so no vax, no enrolment in childcare or kindergarten, which is different from school, but kind of at school. Anyway, um, in, in some states, they said um, that they, they, it was really interesting, actually, so interesting. Well, I think it's really interesting. They, 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 if, they were, if there was more left wing government in power when they brought these policies in, they had a special exemption for anyone that fit a kind of criteria of disadvantage. And it could be that you were First Nations, it could be that you were um, a foster child. And it could be that you were on a healthcare card, which is, I don't know what your equivalent here is, but it's like, it's given to you by the feds, but it's a marker that you're not a high income earner. You're either on welfare or you're low income, government's giving you more money and you get cheaper power and bus fares and every, everything's great. It's, it's like a marker of, I'm poor, please don't hurt me kind of thing. Please, please help me. And so everyone that had one of those would get one of these exemptions if they weren't fully vaccinated. Now in the state of Victoria, other side of Australia, Melbourne is the capital. They brought their policy in in uh, 2016. And what they said was, well, anyone who's in that criteria of disadvantage still gets to come in and we'll call it a grace period, but really it was an exemption because nothing happened at the end of the grace period. So it was an exemption. And then they said, oh, you know, once the kids are in, yes, the, the childcare provider needs to work with the family to make sure they get vaccinated. And then the childcare provider were like, we're childcare providers. It's not really our job. Western Australia, my state, um, and I've you know done the field work, spoken to the bureaucrats who kind of were involved in the policy design. They were really smart, and I'm really proud of what they did. So they basically looked at Victoria's policy and said, yeah, that's pretty good. And it was a Labor, so our left-wing government in Australia, in Western Australia, was the same kind of government as in power, so there was the political will to do the policy. And they said, right, okay, we're going to call it an exemption. We're not going to call it a grace period because we're going to recognise it's an exemption. But we will require the um, child care centre to collect all the stats and data and contact details of these people so that we, the government, can follow up with them and make sure they get vaccinated. So the state kind of took formal responsibility for doing the follow up and reaching those, um, reaching those kids. So to go back to that case we talked about, um, not that it was in a school setting, but in, a, in an early education setting, you would actually have people from the government involved in aware of who's not vaccinated and, and knowing that this is where they need to come and do their outreach to reach those families. So there is a way to close that gap, but you need to design policies with that in mind and then you need to resource their implementation. Can I just add a, a quick on, uh, follow up on that, on, on that comment? So what about the, I forget if it was just specific, there were certain only certain uh, Australian states, the, the no jab, no pay, so which which was in a way more strict than California, so impunitive and, and, and arguably depending on how you want to look at it. So where, where did that fit in the in uh, sure. milieu? Yeah, so so Australia has um the federal policy is no jab, no pay. And that's the one where the government is giving you money to live on, um, to, to support your family, and some of that money is withdrawn if your children are not fully vaccinated. But if you're not, a, if you're a high income earner, and by a high income earner I mean like a professor or even a double income professional family, you're not getting that money from the government, so that mandate's not really touching you. Um, and then the feds would also give you some money to pay for childcare, and you wouldn't, you would lose that money as well if your kids were vaccinated. So the feds control you with money, and the states have five of the states have a no jab, no play policy, and that's the one I was talking about with Western Australia and Victoria. That's the one that says if your kid's not vaccinated, they're not allowed to enrol in childcare. So never mind if you're going to pay more. No, you can't even go. So the two policies um, complement each other. The state policies were in some cases introduced because of an awareness that the federal policy wasn't touching high-income earners. 
and the states wanting to have their own lever that would further be allowed like allow them to um to do that but interestingly we've got a paper coming out about this next year both policies were really the product of one person one person a campaigning journalist for a Rupert Murdoch owned um, newspaper, which of course then is syndicated and the Murdoch's very big in our country as well. Um, and so, yeah, this one, she was really this one person who lobbied um, for this change and, and brought about this change in, in a range of Australian jurisdictions. Oh, good point. Okay, I'm sorry, I was just checking to see if there was anyone online. Like... No, you're good. Um... So I also have just um, one more remaining question. So, Amer so America, like from my experience um, and from other people's experience, I'm sure we could all say that it's a very individualistic country. Um, like its culture is one where people would prefer, where most, where if you ask a good portion of Americans, they would prefer to just be quote unquote left alone. Um, but I guess my that goes into my question where in a country as individualistic as America, where you have people that are already devoutly convinced that vaccines do not work, that would it, would our efforts be better off spent instead of combating misinformation to convince that crowd? Would our efforts be better spent on um, um, reaching directly to, um, to to like you said, child care providers and um, and doctors with local community relations um, with patients that have been visiting them exclusively for decades and to convince people who are are who are well well intentioned but still problematic in their views of vaccines. Great. So I think your question was about: Do you try and get to the diehards, or do you try and deal with the more hesitant and sensitive? Yeah. yeah, definitely the latter, and that's been the kind of conventional wisdom. There was a piece written by Professor Julie Lease, published in Nature in twenty eleven, called "Target the Sensitives," and what she says is still true. Um, but absolutely. So there's a few things we know, which is that a recommendation from a health provider is um, really influential on people's decision to vaccinate or not. So you need the offer and you need the recommendation. Um, I think one of the things that's challenging is that, um, you know, some, especially alternative health providers, have got an economic um, reason to take a, a position against vaccines because then they might be selling a different product like homeopathic uh, products or other treatments or, you know, supplements or whatever, where, you know, they, they, they want to be able to sell you the protection that they tell you the vaccine isn't giving you. Um, and it, so I think definitely, um, I think actually the state should also be thinking about that, those providers. So I have a little bit of a story about that. I wrote this article that was published in Vaccine with um, two colleagues, I think it was published in 2018, and it was called The Unhealthy Other. And it was all about how the vaccinated, that, sorry, the non-vaccinators view the rest of us. And it was, there were some quite profound things in there, like there are people sort of going, when I go and see my doctor, my doctor doesn't look healthy, you know, why would I listen to my doctor? Or my parents, you know, all they do is like pop pills for all their conditions, you know, their diet's terrible, why would I listen to them? You know, but I'm healthy, I'm, you're doing all this good stuff, I'm eating well, I'm exercising, you know, so, so why should I pay attention to this kind of other establishment? Anyway... Um, we also looked at how they kind of trusted their, their alternative health practitioners. And at the end of the article, we make this, at the time, like radical recommendation that everyone kind of scoffed at, which was let's have chiropractors doing the vaccination. Let's, let, let's enable homeopaths if they, if they want to. Let, all these people, let's let them do the real vaccinations if they want to, because it would be a way of kind of reaching the, the people that go and see them that don't go and see, um, you know, the, the, the clinicians. What we weren't so focused on was the economic interest of those organisations. We thought about it, but we didn't go that deep. Anyway, I had this light bulb moment at a conference earlier this year in Thailand where I was hearing, and I forget which um, which country it was, but it was a country in South America, um, and they had done some really good interventions with getting um, more traditional medical healer people who had been taking a position against the COVID vaccine. And once they started paying those folks to vaccinate people, Guess what? <laughs> they were my, and so I thought that is so clever because you actually reach people on their economic interest. So I think that's that's actually a missing opportunity. And yes, the committed vaccine refusers would say, "Oh, we've well, just bought them." Yeah, true, but everybody's for sale, aren't they? <laughs> yes. Uh, but population, population-wise, uh, is there? 
much hope that that approach would be successful. Uh, is what, what we've had in success up until COVID, let's say, has been based on mandates. Mm. Uh, and as recently as this past couple months with Mississippi, uh, the moment they dropped the exemption, the rates started to plummet. Mm. Uh, so is, do you see any hope for alternative approaches working? I, I know mandates are extremely unpopular these days, but historically they've been successful. Well. Yeah, look, historically they've been successful in a range of jurisdictions. This is why I think your country has a unique problem and, and why I'm a bit heartbroken and a bit unable to kind of make good suggestions. Something that we look at quite a bit in the book is the underfunding of public health in America. And so, um, and it, you know, this is something, again, I've talked about with people in, in the other jurisdictions I've looked at in the context of childhood and then starting to in the context of COVID. And if you fund prevention and if you fund public health, then you have more than one tool in the box. And you also have a budget and you also have the political will and you also have the cultural expectation that public health is government business, that it, that it is legitimate for taxpayer money to be used for initiatives that encourage people to like eat more healthy or do more exercise or vaccinate their kids. You know, like where, where I'm from, we're used to the government, you know, telling us what we should be doing. And, and we we are more or less receptive to those messages, but but we accept that the government, it's legitimate for the government to spend some of the money that we earn and they tax to do that. So whether or not those approaches could work, and I think they could, right? I think that they could work. We could we can pay you know, we can pay some alternative health providers to vaccinate people. We can we can reimburse them through your complicated private health insurance scheme thing. But here's the other problem. Um, if if that money is coming from government, you've then got to go back to the whole problem of people not wanting to pay tax to fund those initiatives. And then the same people that don't want to be vaccinated are the same people that are going to even resist that more of saying, well, no, of course I don't want my taxpayer money to fund you know, programs to vaccinate people. So you've kind of, I don't even know what, what name I would give to that problem, but you've got a problem um, that, that I can't think of a solution for. I hope someone else can. we got time for uh, one more question. Well, then I'm going to take the right to ask you real quick then. Um, so uh, your your response there kind of segued into something I was thinking about too. So um, in public policy analysis, you know, so often we're, you know, we're looking at, at much more of the you know, policy level. We're looking at time series, you know, it's like the, you know, the graph of the, uh, the California Department of Public Health graph there after SB 277. And often then we're left with kind of that black box kind of, well, what might might have been going on here? What you think of the green line? So your, your work definitely gets at that. And so I'm, I was kind of curious, given the, just the ongoing for you know decades underinvestment in public health, not just in California, but, but nationally. It, we have, uh, you know, when I talk to public health people, they're like, well, you know, COVID happened, but we have 9,000 other pro projects that we have to sort of manage everything else. So this did come through, it got mandated, but really in terms of, uh, I mean, from your experience and, 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 and your work, what have you found was really sort of the, the on the ground public health worker um, experience of trying to then I guess for lack of a better word, enforce the, enforce the mandate or at least keep up with this in terms of record keeping versus, you know, it can seem like, you know, you, you had the lags and everything else. And I think, because I think that's a, that's an important story here. Are we talking about for COVID here? Oh, uh, no, just for, uh, just even for SB 276 and 77. Yeah. Um, the, the implementation challenge is not something I've gone super deep into for the childhood change. And I think that's because when I came and did my good work in 2019, I think I interviewed about eight people and was intending to come back and do more. And then the pandemic hit. So the depth that I would have liked to have done in that childhood project, I didn't quite get to in, in the realm of implementation. Um, but doing it for COVID-19 has been amazing. This, what I've learned on this trip has just been very, very interesting. Um, yeah. Pardon? You tell. Well, <laughs> just just the just the power of that implementation gap. That, that I just I just visualise this enormous gap between these policymakers in Sacramento, whether they're doing an executive order, which they did of course a lot during COVID, or a, or a state uh, public health officer order, or you know in a more routine setting, whether they're passing legislation, they can do that all they like. 
But if the sheriff in your town is not willing to, you know, put the force of, um, you know, the state or the, the, the town, the county behind that, then then there are going to be limits to what you can do. Um, yeah, so, so, so speaking to kind of county health officers has been very powerful um, and learning more about what they do and what they can try and do and, and, and what they can't do. So that, that yeah, and, 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 yeah, seeing kind of people's frustration with not being able to implement policies, that, you know, in, in some cases and, and no, like basically knowing that there's no stick, there's no tea. So that the, the government said there was, but that guy over there who's got the stick isn't using it, he's said he's not going to use it. So I think that that was really powerful. Um, I think the other thing, um, I guess, you know, the, the other frontline workers that are really important in the context of vaccine mandates are clinicians. Um, because they're the ones who, you know, vaccinate. And so for them, vaccinating people that don't want to be vaccinated can be very challenging. Lots of, so someone told me, I think it was someone over here actually, told me a stat that in my country, that's right, it was a farmer person here in, in the States, told me that in my country there were some of the highest reported, and by reported I mean just reported by people, not, not investigated, not kind of logged, but just reports, really high rates of, like, vaccine injury of, of the kind of more minor scale. And um, th this person was surmising that that was in the context of mandates because, you know, I told you what the mandates were like in my state. There were, there were pretty strict mandates in most other states. Um, so lots and lots of people are having to be vaccinated and people who don't want to be vaccinated, it seems, are, are quite, have quite a propensity to then be like, the vaccine has harmed me. I've got a headache. My arm hurts. You know, and, I mean, we, you know, many of us have reactions to the vaccines, but they, you know, they, they're, they're doing something about it. So there's a whole piece there about the clinicians having to vaccinate people that don't want to be. But actually, um, I've got a paper coming out with one of my students early next year um, that's looking at um, medical exemptions. And there was a little bit of work, um, again, not done by me, um, on the experience of providers who are basically harassed by people who don't want to vaccinate because uh, when you can't get a personal belief or non-medical exemption, the, the, the medical exemption is like the last hole you might get to squeeze your way through and, and, and stay unvaccinated or keep your kid unvaccinated. So... There was one study done here in the States. There was um, one study done in Australia. A couple of other things that we look at, look at in the paper um, of, you know, um, providers describing being coerced, being bribed, sometimes giving, um, or offered bribes, I should say, sometimes giving exemptions that they didn't, that was more here where they're less strict, giving exemptions they didn't really think they should be giving because, it, you know, the alternative is harder. So I think we definitely need to think about these, um, you know, these frontline bureaucrats and uh, what their experience is like and how, at the very least, um, if, you, if you still want to go ahead with that policy, how do you protect those people? How do you keep them safe? How do you protect their mental health? How do you support them? Thank you. Well, that's all the time we have, everyone. So please join me in giving a talk. <laughs>